On the 21st of February 2011, the General Secretary of the Libyan League for Human Rights, Dr. Sliman Bouchigir, initiated a petition in collaboration with the organization UN Watch and the National Endowment for Democracy. This petition was signed by more than 70 NGOs. Then a few days later, on the 25th of February, Sliman Bouchigir went to the UN Human Rights Council in order to present the allegations concerning the crimes of Gaddafi's government. In July 2011, we went to Geneva to interview Dr. Sliman Bouchigir. We started with a question about this petition. You have done a wonderful work in revealing the crimes of Gaddafi notamment grâce à votre pétition qui a réuni is uh, implementing a scorched earth policy his militia are launching massive systematic attacks on those citizens who have spoken out against the regime and on civilians suspected of opposing the regime as well as uh, targeting foreigners these acts may be described as crimes against humanity as we were reminded by the Again, high commission rights league calls uh, for the protection of migrants, allowing them to leave through humanitarian corridors and through other appropriate means. It's simple. Ivan defects and snags the core. You dump it in a pit, and we quirk a recruits missiles. Sounds easy, but button up. This one's a solution to set up an international commission of inquiry into grave human rights violations which are currently being perpetrated in Libya and to suspend the Gaddafi regime from the Human Rights Council. I thank you. A few months later, on July 7, and again in the name of the Libyan League for Human Rights, Sliman Bouchigrier sent a letter to the French lawyers Roland Dumas and Jacques Vergès who had gone to Libya in order to assist the civilian victims of the NATO bombings. In this letter, he accuses the forces loyal to Colonel Gaddafi of a staggering number of civilian murders. You make a state of many crimes in Libya. Mr. Mahmoud, Mr. Mahmoud, D'accord. Donc vous, vous y êtes pris comme ça en fait. Pour collecter ces informations, vous vous êtes adressé directement au CNT. C'est eux qui vous ont fourni ces informations. J'ai reçu ces informations de, 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 de sa part. D'accord. So it seems the man behind these numbers is Mahmoud of the Wafala tribe, Mahmoud Jibril, the number two and prime minister of the Libyan Transitional Council. However, the numbers one can find in the documents of the International Criminal Court are far different from these figures. Nous avons avec nous euh, les documents de la Cour pénale internationale ah, oui, oui, oui. qui datent du 27 juin 2011 oui. et dans lequel euh, donc euh, le procureur... Pardon Il est poursuivi pour le crime ou quand elle est Oui, mais euh, par rapport au nombre de victimes, il est seulement fait état de centaines de victimes. Et le procureur général a lui-même dit qu'on ne pouvait pas relier aujourd'hui euh, les viols, par exemple, euh, aux milices de Kadhafi ni aux armées loyalistes. Donc euh, nous, on revient sur cette, sur cette question-là. Comment nous, on va faire en tant que journaliste pour documenter ça Parce que si la Cour pénale internationale dit l'inverse de ce qui est dit par le Conseil des droits de l'homme, Là, il y a une grosse contradiction. Donc, comment vous, vous avez fait, en fait, pour... Euh... Est-ce que vous avez remis de votre chat en l'air hein D'accord. Nous, on prenait même des gens, les, 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 les petites filles, des garçons qui étaient venus, des, des familles, on ne connaît pas seulement. Évidemment, ils ne vont pas sortir de le dire. Et la Cour pénale internationale, il faut leur faire des documents euh, officiels et convaincants pour pouvoir euh, se référer à un événement déterminé. Mais pour nous, les autres de l'homme, nous savons, nous avons des contacts beaucoup plus proches euh, et beaucoup plus directs que la, la Cour pénale internationale. Moi, j'ai dit tout ça à la Cour pénale internationale aussi. Ils, ils m'ont contacté, je n'ai pas dit tout ça. Mais eux, ils, peuvent, ils, peuvent pas, ils, ils ne peuvent pas. Mmh. Euh, C'est une cour de justice. Ils ne peuvent pas euh, se référer à des, des choses de bouche à oreille. Là. 
So to what is the International Criminal Court referring? On May 16, 2011, its prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo, requested the judges to issue arrest warrants for Muammar Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam and Abdullah al-Sanusi. France and the UK have declared that a military operation against Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's regime may start within hours. The warning comes after the UN Security Council backed a no-fly zone over Libya. We are hearing from the French government that it will act swiftly. The Libyan airspace has been closed. The UN chief, Ban Ki-moon, said that there needs to be immediate action. Now, the Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi has threatened, though, that if the international community intervenes, he says to quote him that he will retaliate immediately. A no-fly zone sounds to your man on the street like a relatively low-key thing. Uh, it just sounds like people won't be allowed to take, uh, take off planes. But of course, I think what people didn't fully understand was that in order to stop Gaddafi's planes taking off, one would actually have to shoot them down. Tomahawk missiles which have been used are not in fact precision guided weapons and they'll cause a lot of civilian casualties. It's begun as it will continue with full-scale uh, military assault on the Libyan people. In this effort, the United States is prepared to act as part of an international coalition. That's why I've directed Secretary Gates and our military to coordinate their planning and tomorrow Secretary Clinton will travel to Paris for a meeting with our European allies and our partners about the enforcement of Resolution 1973. NATO has been watching you closely. NATO knows where you are and will continue to watch you. NATO will not tolerate hostile acts of your intent to conduct hostile acts against the civilian population. NATO will target and strike military equipment which threatens civilians. As you know, we can strike at any time and place of your choosing if you continue to endanger your people. Prove that you want to safeguard your people by moving away from any land, sea, and air military equipment that threatens Libyan population. If you are operating military equipment, including tanks, armored vehicles, artillery, rocket launchers, ships, and aircraft that threaten civilians, you will be targeted by NATO. Move away from all this equipment now to demonstrate that you mean no harm to your people. NATO does not want to kill you, but if you continue to operate, move, maintain, or remain with military equipment of any sort, you will be targeted for destruction. You have time to escape unharmed. Look to your future. Move away from all land. The resolutions passed against Libya are based on various allegations. Notably on the statement claiming that Gaddafi had led jet attacks on his own people and engaged in a violent repression against an uprising, killing more than 6,000 civilians. These allegations were spread before they could have been verified, but it was on the basis of this claim that the Libyan Jamaria government was suspended from the UN Human Rights Council before being referred to the UN Security Council. ...dedicated to enforcing his own new world order to make sure that... ...remain anchored, do not leave port. The Gaddafi regime forces are violating a United Nations resolution ordering the end of hostilities in this country. If you attempt to leave port, you will be attacked and destroyed immediately. For your own safety, do not leave port. The Libyans must remain in port. The government of Libya must obey a resolution of the Nations Unies to stop the hostilities in your country. If you attempt to leave the port, you will be attacked and destroyed immediately. For your own safety, do not leave the port. The battle of the Bahrain and the Libyans is going to be destroyed. Libyan ship or vessel, remain anchored. Do not leave port. The Gaddafi regime forces are violating a United Nations resolution. Distraction is war correspondent Keith Harmon Snow. Some war loving politicians have been pushing for establishing a no fly zone. This means bombing Libyan air defense systems, runways, and shooting down Libyan aircraft. An aerial invasion, something most Americans don't realize and most Libyans don't want. People in, in uh, the entire region remember what happened with the no fly zone in Iraq. Hundreds of civilians were killed. Too, thanks for having me. The crisis in Libya now driving up the price of oil. So, with the fighting there escalating, is now a good time to invest in crude. You know, Our financial expert gives his take. Coalition station. military operations designed to enforce United Nations Security Council resolutions. Well, I, first, I think we have to understand that this is not really a no-fly zone. A no-fly zone, in fact, 
implies a bombing campaign and, and the preparations are ongoing. Some high-ranking officials have taken it so far as to joke about an attack on the African country. But is Libya any of America's business? And why not let the Arab world fend for itself? There's absolutely no uh, possible justification for the United States or even the EU to get involved in Libya. There, there's just nothing in their charters or uh, just, there, there's nothing that would justify this. It's, it's a civil war in a different country in which the details are very marked. Leaders have moved swiftly to enforce a UN resolution for a ceasefire in Libya. After meeting in Paris, French warplanes carried out the first strikes. Under that United Nations resolution. To that end, earlier this afternoon, over 110 Tomahawk cruise missiles fired from both U.S. and British ships and submarines. Uh, the passage of this vote by the United Nations, 10 countries voting in favor. But then we have the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, plus Germany. And they want to have clarity on what's taking place. It's much easier just to get out of the markets when something like this, you know, happens. Having it go over the weekend, you know, it's a whole different story because now you have a little bit of time to digest all of this. So I, I, obviously, I don't think anybody would suggest that the president or this coalition uh, purposely timed this to fall at a time when maybe the markets wouldn't go preserved. These strikes were carefully coordinated with our coalition partners. The targets themselves were selected based on our collective it assessment. Well, it's basically a psychological operation. There's an entire wing of the Pentagon and the State Department that's dedicated to psychological operations. These are perception management is the modern term. The previous term was propaganda. But uh, psychological operation is to convince the American public or the English-speaking world and English-news consuming world that something's going on that may or may not be actually happening. And that's our interests are much more appealing to a lobbyist. He has the ability not only to improve the image of the country in, the, in front of Congress, but also to try to find new markets, try to open up all sorts of joint ventures between the United States and that country. Um, but again... And uh, what's happening against them is a war of aggression with the media serving one side to portray the idea that Gaddafi is a terrorist and all these people have been killed and freedom fighters are involved. Freedom fighter, the language freedom fighter hasn't been used since the attacks against the, by the Contras. We will have no mercy and no pity. Speaking of the city of Benghazi, a, a city of roughly 700,000 people. Auspices is in derogation of international law. You can't simply go into a country and start bombing the hell out of the place on the pretext that you're coming to the rescue of civilians. And since when has President... This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 5th day of July 2011, and today I'm joined on the line by Mahdi Darius Nazamroya, the Global Research Associate, who is now on a trip to Tripoli. He is in Tripoli right now, reporting from Libya about what's happening in that country as we speak. So, Mahdi, it's great to have you back on the program. Please tell us what's going on. Okay. They've been bombing sites that have nothing whatsoever to do with military, facilities, combat, or command and control. They've been bombing granaries, food storage places, hospitals. Uh, people from around the world have seen it. I've spoken to foreign nationals who've been living here for business reasons or for family reasons, or they just like Libya generally. A fellow Canadian was telling me he was held. They bombed everywhere residential areas they've been bombing for no reason I spoke to an Italian lady the other day she was telling me she used to believe everything the media said until she started living what the media was saying and contradicted reality uh, she was disgusted I've spoken to people from, uh, from all over uh, the world who've been living here they, they're in shock the resolutions passed against Libya are based on various allegations Notably on the statement claiming that Gaddafi had led jet attacks on his own people and engaged in a violent repression against an uprising, killing more than 6,000 civilians. 
These allegations were spread before they could have been verified, but it was on the basis of this claim that the Libyan Jamaria government was suspended from the UN Human Rights Council before being referred to the UN Security Council. One of the main sources for the claim that Gaddafi was killing his own people is the Libyan League for Human Rights, an organization linked to the International Federation of Human Rights, the, the FID. The media is ignoring or belittling them at best. They constitute the majority of the population and they support their leader and they don't need guns. They have their strength in numbers. Most importantly, they are the real freedom fighters fighting for a democratic system that puts ours to shame. The executive order signed by President Obama has sparked controversy on both sides of the political aisle. The National Defense Resources Preparedness Executive Order was signed quietly Friday night. It gives the president the power to, to control U.S. resources in times of war and peace. And this includes food, water, oil, and transportation. Vast reserves of gold. And Libya was, was in the process of, of supporting, of championing uh, an African dinar backed by gold. Right. And that would rival the euro. Well, it would have okay. sidestepped the whole Rothschild game. And that's, exactly. that's something you don't exactly. do. Exactly. And the, and, and was... What about these rebels? These people who are fighting for democracy? First of all, have you noticed that they are proudly waving around a monarchy flag in the name of democracy? Have you also wondered why the fighting is lasting so long in the... uh, We had reports some days ago that a Scott missile was fired from near the town of Surf, uh, part of his hometown. Um, what's your take on that? Do you think it's an act of desperation? Can you shed more light on why this missile was fired and whether we can expect more to be fired? Mm-hmm. Fired on whom? We believe it will oh, slide what? towards uh, the rebels' position okay. in Brega. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about the people who are in the area of Brega or the area of Brega. I'm sure that it Make sure, maybe uh, it has come from the sea, not from land. And in the other hand, we don't have any ships in the sea. We don't have, of course, ships in the sea. The leader, Muammar Gaddafi, is a leader of the Libyan revolution and a symbolic figure for the Libyan nation. His family is a genuine Libyan family that had fought before with other Libyan families against foreign occupation. And recently, Libyans have expressed their views about the leader in the uh, massive rallies that took place in every Libyan city. The leader, Muammar Gaddafi, is not involved in any political dialogue between Libyans in which Libyans can decide their political future. And this is what we uh, told the high-level committee of the African Union concerned with the Libyan case. وعلي أن بقاء معمر القذافي في ليبيا وبقاء بين شعبه هو في وطنة مكرم معزز وله كل الاحترام من الشعب الليبي كزعيم وقائد ثورة. Therefore, the leader, of course, uh, with his family, would stay in Libya and would always be the symbolic figure of this nation, uh, loved by many. And he is not within the political dialogue for the future of Libya. Okay? Uh, yes, please. Okay.
What if our foreign policy of the past century is deeply flawed and has not served our national security interest? What if we wake up one day and realize that the terrorist threat is a predictable consequence of our meddlings in the affairs of others and has nothing to do with us being free and prosperous? What if propping up repressive regimes in the Middle East endangers both the United States and Israel? What if occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and bombing Pakistan is directly related to the hatred directed toward us? What if someday it dawns on us that losing over 5,000 American military personnel in the Middle East since 9-11 is not a fair trade-off for the loss of nearly 3,000 American citizens, no matter how many Iraqi, Pakistan, Afghan people are killed or displaced. Contrary to the rumors that you've heard, I was not born in a manger. I was actually born on Krypton and sent here to save the planet Earth. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives. A startling display of shameless war profiteering, Britain's Defence Secretary has urged the country's sales directors to pack their suitcases, head to Libya, and make a grab for the highly lucrative spoils of war. With Gaddafi's murdered corpse still unburied and lying as a gruesome tourist attraction in a Misrata meat store, Philip Hammond, in a BBC interview, bluntly recommended British companies, even British sales directors, to be packing their suitcases and looking to get out to Libya and take part in the reconstruction of that country as soon as they can. After the plundering of those other recent victims of Western neo-imperial aggression, Afghanistan and Iraq, the tried and tested formula of destroying a sovereign nation's infrastructure and then swooping in to win multi-billion dollar reconstruction contracts should come as a surprise to no one. It's nonetheless startling to hear the British government dispense with standard humanitarian rhetoric and unashamedly green light British businesses feasting on the freshly slaughtered cadaver of Libya's NATO bomb devastated infrastructure. As in Iraq, a mutually beneficial relationship between corruptible Libyan politicians and predatory Western development firms is almost guaranteed. This sick war profiteering is made even more objectionable by the fact that our corporatist economic system, where crony capitalism sees corporations and states working hand in hand, requires British taxpayers to fund reconstruction projects and line the pockets of private business. So not only have taxpayers funded the bombs that have killed thousands of innocent Libyans and destroyed the country's infrastructure, estimated at over a billion dollars for the US and as high as 1.75 billion pounds for Britain, but they will also be forced to contribute to its rebuilding, boosting the bottom line of the vulturish corporations. As an example of the potential cost, the reconstruction of Iraq had by 2008 cost the US taxpayer more than 100 billion dollars with millions lost through fraud and unfinished projects. At a time of great economic hardship for many British and American taxpayers, the fact that we're forced to pay for the carnage of the unjustified war in Libya and then subsidize the post-war profit chasing of private companies is disgraceful. Whilst organized resistance to the political and financial elites is in its infancy, the recent Occupy events offer some small hope that the people are beginning to fight back against the warmongering state and their corporatist cronies. As well as physical occupations, organized tax resistance will be, in my opinion, an important front in the developing battle between the people and the corrupt elites. It's time to make a stand and say no to this grossly immoral insanity. In many ways, this is blatant fraud. In each country, I requested basic information regarding ongoing and completed projects from local USAID offices. And among other things, my request included a number of projects and, and projected an annual co and actual costs, and whether USAID had verified the completion of the project. Officials in each country could not produce this most basic information. USAID has since provided some of the information I have requested. However, I am concerned that it took eight weeks and a formal congressional inquiry to assemble the data. This is data that I believe should be readily available to the American people. And on the slides, for those of you that are here in this room, you will see some of the pictures uh, that were, have been taken along the way. 
Americans are paying top dollar for foreign assistance. Unfortunately, taxpayers is not getting a top dollar results. In Haiti, buildings are in shambles. Mounds of trash cover the streets, and electrical grids are substandard. More than a year after the earthquake, only 5 percent, 5 percent of the millions of cubic feet of rubble have been removed. As of November 2010, only 22 percent of shelters have been built. Having been there and seen it for myself, I wonder if these numbers are generous. Libyan ship or vessel, remain anchored. Do not leave port. The Gaddafi regime forces are violating a United Nations resolution ordering the end of hostilities in your country. If you attempt Greetings, citizens of the world. We are anonymous. As you may all note, there is a war currently going on in Libya. What you probably do not know, is what really is happening there, and the reason it is happening. Muammar Gaddafi had brought his country, into an age, of prosperity, and he is loved by his people. However, the very same actions that let Libya progress, has brought her to her doom. You can find everything you need to know about this conflict, in the description of this video. We thereby announce Operation Truth of Libya. Operation Truth of Libya is fairly simple. The objective is to get informed. Inform yourself about the truth of this conflict. Inform others about the truth of this conflict. The truth that is truly scary and enraging. The truth that our mainstream media, controlled by imperialist monsters, has failed to deliver to us. We the people have the power to stop our governments. They know this, and this is why they lie to us. The Internet has tons of information that is neither controlled, nor filtered. This is now our biggest weapon against government lies. Inform yourself. Inform your friends and relatives. An informed country is the worst enemy of corrupt governments, that wage wars for profit of the rich. NATO. The United Nations. Barack Obama. Rothschild. We are watching you. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. The impact of NATO's activities on the people. They claim that they are responsible for a humanitarian intervention, but they are creating a, huma a humanitarian crisis. Two of his grandchildren and their mother are among the dead. Oh, no, you're killing our children! You are a hypocrite! Next to Mr. Alpha Weldy was his son Khaled, mourning a pregnant wife, a three-year-old son, and a six-year-old daughter. This is our army! This is my, my soul, my kid! This, this morning, NATO admits that an air raid on Libya's capital, Tripoli, killed civilians on Sunday. The power of the explosion blew a double-story dwelling to a heap of concrete, chunks of rubble, and twisted reinforcing bars. It appears that one weapon did not strike the intended target due to a weapons systems failure. A frantic rescue operation pulled out no survivors. Nine people died in the blast and 18 were injured. Until the United States reduces its military spending to support our economics and moral aggressions around the world, we will be a menace to life on the planet. When Eisenhower was going out, Eisenhower was warning the American people and the establishment, be, oh, beware of the military industrial complex. And what he was saying, that we will move to war in order to feed that monster. So America now engaged in 
three wars spending billions of dollars. This is an imperialist war. They know that Libya has the largest oil reserves in all of Africa, the ninth largest oil reserves in the world. If no, no new oil fields were discovered in Libya, and many will be discovered, but if no new oil fields were discovered, at the current rate of production, Libya has enough oil to produce at this level for the next 63 years. That's a prize that ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, any in Italy, and the others want. They didn't start to carry out regime change in late February or March. In April 1986, they carried out the attempted assassination of Gaddafi with U.S. Air Force planes. They bombed his house then. He wasn't about to, quote, massacre a group in Benghazi. They've been trying to carry out regime change in Libya since the 1969 revolution when Libya stood up and said, Libya belongs to Libya. They've come out here with their green flags to show defiance, to show their support for Muammar Gaddafi and his regime. And they swelled to the front in great numbers to leave, hear an audio message from Brother Leader. This is the first time they are facing an armed nation of millions. They will be defeated. The alliance will be defeated. After more than 4,000 strike sorties on Libya, NATO doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. They say it's not just about military might, it's about political will. But if you see these scenes, if you listen to the sounds, and you test the will of the people here, there's really a sense that this crisis in Libya isn't ending anytime soon. The common consensus among the demonstrators out here today is that the U.S. and NATO intervention in Libya is illegal. So I'm here in today's protest. One because my interest as a New York City public school teacher lies in the money that is being misspent or um, wasted in killing innocent people in other countries. This is another um, war starting for U.S. interests that have nothing to do with the people here in the United States. Libya is for Libyans to decide what to do with their countries. They marched on the United States Embassy in the South African capital, Pretoria, chanting hands off Libya, hands off Gaddafi, and hands off the Libyan people. The main reason why I'm here today is to uh, protest against the bombs in Libya. Being an African American, I think that anything that happens to our brothers and sisters in Africa also happens to me. So when you're bombing Libya, you're bombing me too. But the big demonstration will culminate, as Viola said, right here in Harlem, August 13th, and that's a demonstration which we can make to be a historic event. supposed to be a humanitarian intervention, an effort to help a people who rose up against a brutal regime, blood to prevent a bloodbath, or so went the argument. But a year later, the outcome of NATO's intervention in Libya remains murky. Reports of militias roaming wild, chaos, uncertainty, and the rule of law seemingly nowhere to be seen. Now, are these the growing pains of democracy or the continuation of a civil war that shows no sign of resting up? Well, journalist Stephen Lenman joins me now. He's been covering this issue. So let's take the question to him. Stephen, uh, what's, what's your assessment of the current events in Libya a year later? Libya, in a word, Lucy, is a charnel house. Libya, before the insurgency began, before a NATO-backed, supported, armed insurgency began, was peaceful and calm. It had Africa's highest standard of living. The Libyan people had benefits Americans can only dream of. Free education, free health care, uh, stipends for newlyweds, free housing help. There was no homelessness in Libya. Libya now is ravaged. NATO came in. Whenever NATO shows up, Lucy, violence, mass killing, mass destruction follows. And now it continues to rage. It will rage. There'll be protracted conflict 
I think for years to come, you've got these rogue killer gangs, the same ones, the same types that are ravaging Syria, they're ravaging Libya. Libyans are being killed. There's a green resistance. This is the Jamaharia loyalists, the people who supported Gaddafi with good reason. He supported them. He gave them all these wonderful social benefits. They're all gone. NATO took them away. The country is absolutely in turmoil, and this thing will go on. Well, let's not paint uh, Gaddafi as a saint. Of course, uh, a lot of atrocious crimes committed uh, by that government, too, but that still doesn't necessarily rise to the level of interventionism. And so you mentioned Syria. Um, what do you think uh, the motivation would be for some sort of uh, destabilization uh, uh, or intervention in, in Syria for the West? Doesn't it threaten the West if, if it leads to more instability and chaos? Oh, well, Washington thrives on instability, Lucy. Instability gives Washington a reason to intervene. And Washington's aim is very simple, backed by key NATO partners, backed by Israel. Washington wants complete dominance over the region, the Middle East, North Africa, into Central Asia, to Russia and China's borders. It needs instability to justify going in. If it doesn't exist, it creates it. Again, Libya was calm. Syria was calm, Iran has been calm, all three are targeted for one reason. They're independent regimes, they're not, they're not pro-Western. Washington won't tolerate this. It wants pro-Western client states. Where they don't exist, Washington intervenes any way it needs to. But, but, but Stephen, uh, in the case of Syria, for example, if we look at who the opposition is, right, we have these uh, Sunni youths, uh, many of them have been radicalized uh, after years of uh, sort of living in the in the minority there. And uh, if, if, if we do back the rebels, if there is intervention, if these guys come into power, uh, what's the guarantee that this would be some sort of a government that would be subservient or, or, or even uh, open to working with the U.S.? We haven't really had the best uh, history of uh, working with radical Islamists, say, for uh, arming the, uh, the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan in our fights in, against the Soviets? Well, the Mujahideen were created by uh, the West during the Reagan administration. Al-Qaeda is, is a Washington-created entity. Al-Qaeda, by the way, is used both as enemy and uh, an ally. It uses an ally, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Uh, how, how is Al-Qaeda used as an ally? I'm sorry? How is al-Qaeda used as an ally? Well, the Mujahideen fought the Soviets in uh, Afghanistan, and that was the ally. But rhetorically, uh, al-Qaeda is demonized as an enemy, but al-Qaeda is used. Bin Laden, when he was alive, was used. He didn't realize it. He was being used through Pakistan's inter-services intelligence. It's ISI. This is the way America operates. But America has no qualm about an Islamist government. Look at Saudi Arabia. Extremely radicalized uh, Islamist. Close U.S. ally. It would be very happy to assemble a government in, in Syria, in Libya, anywhere in the region. Uh, what America wants is any, any regime, whether it's Islamist, secular, whatever, radical, not so radical. It simply wants a regime that supports Western interests, mainly Washington's. What's going on in Syria, you've got two opposition groups. You've got a nonviolent one internally in the country, and, you, and you've got the violent Western-generated one, the Free Syrian Army, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Syrian National Council based in Turkey. This, uh, they support violence, but, but the, but the nonviolent opposition Assad doesn't attack them. He, he attacks defensively when, when the violent insurgents attack Libyan people. It was a little bit different in, in, in Libya. The insurgents were violent. There was only one insurgency. It was violent. It was Western supported. It was supported on the ground by UK, by French, by Qatari special forces, US and British intelligence early on, before the bombing began in March in Libya, mm -hmm. six, six UK special forces were helicoptered in at night. They were caught. All they right. were dressed in black. 
They, they had maps. They were heavily armed. And the U.K. government said this about them. And we're going to have to, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that as a cliffhanger. What did the U.K. government say? Uh, I'm sure you'll be writing about this. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, Stephen Lenman, a writer and host of the Progressive Radio News Hour. thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lucy. Records are blocked. You conspiracy hack, and I know my rights, so you gonna need a warrant for that. Well, wow, aren't you sharp as a tack? Are you some type of lawyer or something? Well, I'm not a lawyer for nothing. I passed the bar, so I know quite a bit. Enough that you don't stand a fucking chance. Yeah. Well, let's see how smart you are when the election comes. I got 99 problems, but this bitch ain't one. <laughs> 99 problems, but this bitch ain't one. With all your bank problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems. But bitch, not one hit me. Criminal, fraud, repression, deceit. I murder and I plunder for the world elite. We invade countries till we have all they own. I have a dream. Well, I have a dream. I'm Barack Obama, and I like this remix. It just seems like these candidates are just going to keep expanding the military, pressing on, on these threats from all around the world. Um, you just said yourself that they present us with this false dichotomy that we have to choose between two war presidents because one is going to be a bigger war president. We're kind of scared to see where he might take the country. I mean, do you, what do you think that this is a set up so we can continue the wars endlessly? I mean, there's really no other option. And you're right, a lot of people do choose for the less of two evils, let's say. Yeah, personally, I'm inclined not to choose evil, but both of these parties are sold out to the weapons makers and the other war profiteers and answer to them before they answer to the American people. Three quarters of us want out of Afghanistan. Large majorities of us want military spending cut back, and the more people are informed, the more they believe that. Uh, we don't have that candidate in those two parties. Uh, and so. Uh, my recommendation, as always, is to put 95 or more percent of our effort and resources into building an activist movement to fix this problem, regardless of who's in the White House, uh, and then go vote your conscience. David, I wanted to play a clip really quickly from that speech in San Diego of Mitt. Uh, go ahead and roll that. We have two courses we could follow. One is to follow in the pathway of Europe, to shrink our military smaller and smaller to pay for our our social needs and they of course rely upon the strength of America and they hope for the best were we to follow that kind of course there'd be no one that could stand to protect us the other is to commit to preserve America as the strongest military in the world second to none with no comparable power anywhere in the world uh, it seems like in that speech I mean people are booing when he's saying cut cut the military to pay for social services. I mean, that's not happening. And instead, the Pentagon is um, bolstering the military and cutting social services time and time again. I mean, do you think that this is also a false dilemma that we're presented with, that if we cut the military, somehow our country will be weak? And um, what do you think about what he said right there? Well, I think it's refreshing to have military spending and the costs of human needs spending paired together, even though he's on the opposite side from what I am. That is the choice before us, and it is a choice where Europe and other parts of the world have gone a different direction. It's not clear that the United States military is protecting Europe. On the contrary, we seem to be making a target for terrorists out of Europe, offending the people of Europe, keeping nuclear weapons illegally in non-nuclear European states and so forth. I think that there is a lesson to be found in the fact that the United States is number 38 in life expectancy and so on through all the categories of well-being in our society. That's what that crowd is cheering for, running down our society for the sake of building up weapons that we do not need. There is not evidence that we would not be better off following that European route. Do you think at this point, David, uh, I mean, you said that he, he, you know, he speaks a lot about Iran, even Russia, China. I mean, he's mentioning all these countries that, I mean, do you think that this is harmful rhetoric uh, to stand behind to say that we need to be constantly on the offense? I think it's incredibly dangerous. I think this is how the military-industrial complex works. It puts money and momentum behind war plans and ne neglects 
alternatives to war, and we end up looking at a choice between war or nothing. Uh, but it's not just Romney. I mean, within the past couple of weeks, we've heard the prime minister of Russia talking about the possibility of war, offended by the bases being set up, up along the border of Russia in Eastern Europe. We haven't heard this kind of talk in a long time, and it's not just the result of Mitt Romney campaigning. It's also the result of missile so-called defense bases being built. Uh, so we have a problem, but it pervades both of these parties. Thanks so much for joining us, David. That was David Swanson, campaigner for Root. The destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Our source was the New York Times. The Iranian Republic Security Forces not only shows their deep hatred for the Western Israel, but offers an insight into the fanatical mantra they recite. He is not supposed to talk about other activities, military activities, conventional activities, missile activities, or other activities. This is none of the business of the IAEA. U.S. and others are trying to change agency to intelligence information-driven safeguard, and that is not acceptable. Yesterday's revelation that Iran has been working on nuclear bomb detonators should convince even the most naive officials within our government of Iran's ultimate intention. I do not believe that petroleum sanctions alone will dissuade the Iranian regime from its obvious intention to acquire nuclear weapons, nor from its stated goal of wiping Israel off the map, nor from its unremitting hostility toward our own country. But I do believe that it will send a vital message of growing Western resolve at a critical moment in world history. Despite the denials from Iran, the UN nuclear watchdog says much of the work that's been done in the country could only be used for the purpose of building a nuclear bomb. The IAEA accuses Iran of producing the materials needed for a nuclear weapon, as well as acquiring design information from a secret nuclear supply network and fitting those designs into existing missiles and then test firing. The explosion chamber measures 4.6 meters in diameter and has a length of 18.8 meters. An elevation system suspends explosives in the upper part of the chamber during testing. This cleans up the room 
and removes explosives residue that could be picked up by international monitors. A neutron detector measures any sign of neutron emissions. The explosion chamber is housed inside a superstructure. This helps to shield the chamber from satellite surveillance. started enriching uranium to 20% purity in early 2010. After talks on a nuclear fuel swap with US, France and Russia broke down, despite Iran's positive response stipulated in the Tehran Declaration, brokered by Turkey and Brazil. Fuel rods are being loaded in and in the presence of Ahmadinejad. There, there are few who are more worried than the Israelis. Remember, famously, it was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad who said that he wanted to see uh, Israel wiped off the face of the earth, although there will be Iranians who will argue that there was a translation error from Farsi to English, which actually meant that he wanted to envisage a world without Israel rather than he had some great plan uh, to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The big concern, of course, is that Iran uh, is trying to put together the know-how, the pieces of the jigsaw. The weapon uses the same kind of technology that is used for satellites and rockets launched into space. Al Alam's correspondent says the missile is not restricted by certain geographic locations and could be launched from anywhere in Iran. Iranian officials previously said that the Sejil has a range of up to 1,240 miles. U.S. defense officials say the missile has a range to hit Israel and U.S. In 1992, I bought a couple of satellite dishes and spent the entire year flipping through the channels looking for feeds. I'd lock onto a satellite and go channel by channel through its transmission, recording the feeds. Then I would move on to the next satellite, and the next one, and the next one. By the end of the year, I'd recorded more than 500 hours of feeds. Don't put a lot of that garbage on it. What is this? Are we on the national... Can we turn that on? I don't want to be on national television being Mr. Um, Madoff. We're just turning the camera away from it. Some of the feed guests knew, and some didn't know, their images were being broadcast, unscrambled and visible, to over three and a half million dish owners across North America. Those who knew they were being watched attempted to stay out of satellite TV's wide frame. But after spending hours a day inside of a television studio, television had become their home. Yeah, when your column in USA Today came in. On that thing, on that book. <laughs> I always remember the card you sent me. For the networks, making news meant making profits, as the candidates made nearly 100 talk show appearances. Tell Bill if he'd do that thing in New York, it'll be true. He's so good at this. Yeah, yeah. One of the problems with staying on a bus too long is the two of you guys are so good on me. Towards the end of the election, candidate appearances increased TV talk show ratings an average of 40 percent. You know what you ought to do? You ought to come out on the uh, bus. bus trip with us uh, one day. We could do a, we could do a joint uh, interview from the bus. Larry King said the campaign ratings bonanza turned the election into a TV miniseries like Roots or the Thorn Birds. We're out of time. You can invite us on the bus. Okay. Uh, we have plum run out of time. Thanks for coming, Al. I I I'd like to invite you to come on the bus with us. 1992 was probably an historic first as a major network's advertising revenues from its political coverage made more money than it cost to report the campaign. For CNN, the election was a watershed as the network received its highest ratings since the Gulf War. But I want him to finish the thought here. That's the one break we have to hit live. 
watched in around the world, but hard to believe we're being watched in 151 countries. It's scary. I go, I'm in Israel, I'm at the Wailing Wall. True story, Israel, never been there before. They're with my brother. I'm Jewish, it's my culture. Stand there, it's an old rabbi, dominating. He's praying, he's an old, a religious Jewish man. He looks up at me and he says, what's with Perot? <laughs> I swear to God, what's with Perot? In Israel. I love it. <laughs> Crazy. Ted Turner changed the world. I'm a big fan of yours. Is he? He would uh, serve you, Pastor. Um, I don't okay. know. I'm really surprised. He's ready. What's he, gonna, what's he got left in life? The game. I, you know, after you're elected, no. think about it. No dope. That's for sure. <laughs> Great guy to work for. Hi. So to speak. Amid a continuing allegations of tabloid reports pointing to extramarital affairs, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton is this noon campaigning across the South. Hello, Mike. Everybody in America who's had problems in their marriage, who either wound up divorced or who got back together, votes for me. I'm a shoe in. Can you hear me? I figure if everybody in Maryland who's ever had trouble in their marriage and they're still together, or who's ever been divorced, votes for me. I'm a shoe in. Uh, hello. And you know, if every American couple who's either been divorced or had problems and stayed married, votes for me, I'm a shoe-in for re-election. I think the American people are smarter than the pundits. Before Clinton was shooed into office, he had to compete against a host of other Democratic candidates. The media focused on four of these candidates, but Larry Agron was a fifth candidate the press did not report on. There's no makeup here? During the 1992 U.S. Conference of Mayors, the New York Times reported that, quote, dozens of mayors seem to agree on one thing. The single candidate who truly understands urban needs is Larry Agron, unquote. They promised to bring this stuff over. None of the networks mentioned Agron's presence at the convention. I thought if I run over that super one of Agron's staff had to run over to the Super Saver and buy some makeup because the network had broken its promise to provide it. This was typical of the media's treatment of Agron. When he appeared at this Democratic candidate's forum, this Associated Press photo simply cropped Agron out of the frame. During the New Hampshire primary, the TV news reported the polling numbers of the top five Democratic candidates, Brown, Clinton, Harkin, Kerry, and Songus. When Agron moved into a three-way tie with Harkin and Brown with 2% of the vote, most of the TV news didn't mention Agron. The day Bill Clinton captured what may have been the most valuable airtime of the entire election, as he spoke to 50 million viewers about his alleged affair, was the same day that a poll showed Agron's support at 4%. He had passed Brown and was the fifth leading candidate. When ABC's Sunday Evening News reported this poll, they simply deleted Agron entirely by not reporting his candidacy. During the New Hampshire primary, Agron's only live commercial TV appearance was through this satellite feed to ABC's Nightline. But the Nightline program wasn't directly about the election. When Agron complained to news executives about his lack of coverage, he was told he had not earned the right to media exposure because he had not received enough media exposure. And on stage, the five major contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination. Although Agron was on the ballot in nearly half the country, he was barred from most televised debates, including this one sponsored by the League of Women Voters. He couldn't meet one of the League's main criteria, which was, quote, recognition by the national media as a candidate meriting media attention, unquote. Good evening and welcome to the Democratic presidential candidates debate on urban America. Agron wanted to debate on urban America, calling for a 50 percent cut in defense spending and the reinvestment of some of that money into America's decaying cities. We are going to 
be coming to you, rather, live from Lehman College, and you'll hear a bit of a disturbance in the background, but we'll go on with that in any case. The disturbance is Larry Agron asking to be included in the debate so that he can explain his plans for defense cuts and urban revitalization. Bronxboro President Ferdinand Ferrer, and Mr. President, I suggest you wait for just a moment till the man is quieted or chooses to quiet down. All right, Mr. Mr. Ferrer. Agron was quickly arrested. His court date fell on the first day of the Democratic National Convention. During this campaign, but very little said about the problems facing America's cities. Tonight, we'll change all that. Without media exposure and the debates, Agron couldn't quickly receive federal campaign funds, and his candidacy lost momentum. Uh, you look all right on camera. What's that? You look all right. There's no hot spots. So. Really? Okay. Well, you got a mustache that shows through here. Okay, Why don't you go get some stuff, Mike? Go. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> campaign funds. The Democratic Party refused to include Agron in the debates or speak to the networks on his behalf. Agron talked about his exclusion, saying, I've challenged my own party for its continuing complicity in Cold War thinking, Cold War rhetoric, and Cold War budgets. To restore order right now, there are 3,000 National Guardsmen on duty in the city of Los Angeles. Another 2,200 stand ready to provide immediate support. I, so to speak. Okay. You see? Paul. So to speak. Okay. You see? Paul. Oh, what a beautiful morning. In 1992, the networks had their own solutions for urban decay. This morning, we're here looking for solutions. CBS looked for solutions at L.A.'s Martin Luther King Hospital. Well, a hospital like Martin Luther King can see more trauma than all of Western Europe does in a year. Hmm. In fact, there's so much trauma there that the U.S. Army sends its combat surgeons there so they get a sense of what these very severe fear wounds were like. In fact, when I was in the Gulf War, a number of the senior combat surgeons had trained right here at Martin Luther King hmm. Hospital. Dr. Bob, thanks. Before he went on air, part of Dr. Bob's diagnosis was cut out because it was too obtuse. Yeah, so what's your impression? Because my impression is, you know, places like South Central LA, around the country, look more and more like real third world countries, or third world countries without the hope. That is, they have no medical care, they have no real economy, and, um, they, and yet, in a third world country, it's developing. There's some onward development. There's some vision for the future. Well, you have your, your impressions of the medical care are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I think that gets too obtuse. How about, how about if I were to ask about the level of the, the trauma care here? has always been considered superior, has it not, to other parts of the country? Good. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's the best, the best. You know, Can I, why don't I say something like that? Okay. You know, As the conditions of the cities became obtuse to the networks, they turned to the suburbs to render a verdict on the campaign. And later, I on the campaign, you will see and hear some of the suburban voters who may very well decide this election. Back now live from St. Louis, there is news far beyond this city tonight. In, uh, what is this, in Hawaii? Haiti. In Haiti, oh, oh, oh. well, they all look alike. <laughs> In Haiti, a huge explosion leveled a three-story building in downtown Port-au-Prince. At least 15 Haitians were killed. Take a look at the roads leading into and out of Los Angeles. Lately, you see more taillights than headlights. A lot of people leaving this town for good. Where are they going? Anywhere else. Why? While the ethnically diverse cities were abandoned for the homogeneous suburbs, the networks created their own recipes for the melting pot. Make a note. Give it to Kathy, who may be the best at this. Since we're going to wish uh, people a happy Rosh Hashanah, which is my idea and a good idea, just don't forget to check when Ramadan is. We have to wish all of our Muslim friends happy Ramadan. And then behind that, when you get to the Buddhist New Year, the year of the rat or the year of the monkey, whatever it is, we have to... We've got to be politically correct here, pal. 
After four Los Angeles police officers were found not guilty of assaulting Rodney King, the TV news moved away from the residents of L.A. and into the sky with 13 television-equipped helicopters. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're still hung up in our court here. Um, they're just marching up and down the streets, and they formed a big bulkhead here at the end of the, at the corner. The distant coverage in the sky was emulated on the ground by the scarce street reporters who tried to glide by without speaking to the protesters of the verdict. With the chants, no justice, no peace is what they're chanting. No peace! No justice, no peace! You can hear them now. No peace! We can stick going here. No peace! No justice, no peace! Now let's go. No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no, no peace. peace. We ain't this got men to change, people. Men this change. should never have been a change of venue. No justice, there no should peace. never have been a change no of justice, venue. No and as a result, no this is what you have. This is what you have. There's no clips down here. There's no bloods down here. There's just concerned citizens down here that don't like the way the system is done. This is what we're talking about. Could you tell me, sir, could you tell me? Could you tell me? The police are closing in. They're cutting Okay, they're, they're off. You did that, they cut us. Huh? They cut us when you did that. Uh, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. The voiceless scenes from South Central L.A., where nearly 50% of the children live in poverty, was contextualized by the $600,000 a year TV news anchors. As the looting goes on, in a senseless fashion, people arguing for sanity on the one hand, simultaneous looting in a random fashion for things that people can't even use. 25 years ago, the media's coverage of the riots in the Watts area of Los Angeles was called racially divisive by the federally empowered Kerner Commission. The commission was formed in order to find the root causes of the urban violence of the late 1960s. It found that one cause was the massive economic collapse and poverty of the cities. The other was the media. The Kerner Commission found the media guilty of failing to communicate to all ethnic groups the complex and fundamental problems of race relations. This L.A. news anchor made these comments moments before reporting the verdict in the second LAPD beating trial of Rodney King. Okay, I'm standing by, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have shit to say. We don't have anything to do. But by God, the management of this company deems it necessary that I come on the shut the shit out of all of you. In just half an hour from now, the jury in the federal Rodney King beating trial will be back in session. The Kerner Commission said media's failure to communicate was caused in part by the media's shockingly backward hiring practices. Hardly any people of color worked as TV news directors, the people who set policy and make decisions. Television responded to the criticism by hiring cameramen, clerks, and makeup artists that were African-American, Latino, and Asian-American. For each of these ethnic groups, the number of TV news directors is a few percentage points above zero since the Kerner Commission's verdict 25 years ago. You, you announced that they get rid of their gates tomorrow, and they'll stop tomorrow. You announced that. As the networks covered over the voices from L.A., the candidates told the story of their own. I felt anger. I felt pain. I thought, how can I explain this to my grandchildren? This was very effective. Yeah. What? And also, when you talked about talking about both Barbara and your kids, about how do I explain this to my grandchildren? And given the fact that this is a presidential election year, it's also a challenge to the man who would challenge the president for the country's leadership. A large grassroots global movement that unifies humanity to step up against this rather sick distortion that has emerged throughout power across the board. We can talk about the neuroses of the U.S. empire. We can talk about the neuroses of, of various Arabic states, of Israel as well. We can talk about all of these things to death as far as the specifics. 
But at the very core of this comes a deep social change that's required, and it's going to take a grassroots movement to move this forward. I have little faith in the change coming from, coming from the state empires. Well, we uh, understand that you'll be working on it. In the meantime, Peter Joseph, founder of yes. the Zeitgeist Movement. A number of years ago, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, produced a document entitled Modern Money Mechanics. This publication detailed the institutionalized practice of money creation as utilized by the Federal Reserve and the web of global commercial banks it supports. On the opening page, the document states its objective. The purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. It then proceeds to describe this fractional reserve process through various banking terminology. A translation of which goes something like this. The United States government decides it needs some money, so it calls up the Federal Reserve and requests, say, $10 billion. The Fed replies, saying, sure, we'll buy $10 billion in government bonds from you. So the government takes some pieces of paper, paints some official looking designs on them, and calls them treasury bonds. Then it puts a value on these bonds to the sum of $10 billion and sends them over to the Fed. In turn, the people at the Fed draw up a bunch of impressive pieces of paper themselves, only this time calling them Federal Reserve Notes, also designating a value of $10 billion to the set. The Fed then takes these notes and trades them for the bonds. Once this exchange is complete, the government then takes the $10 billion in Federal Reserve Notes and deposits it into a bank account. And upon this deposit, the paper notes officially become legal tender money, adding $10 billion to the U.S. money supply. And there it is. $10 billion in new money has been created. Of course, this example is a generalization, for, in reality, this transaction would occur electronically, with no paper used at all. In fact, only 3% of the U.S. money supply exists in physical currency. The other 97% essentially exists in computers alone. Now, government bonds are, by design, instruments of debt. And when the Fed purchases these bonds, with money it essentially created out of thin air, the government is actually promising to pay back that money to the Fed. In other words, the money was created out of debt. This mind-numbing paradox of how money or value can be created out of debt or a liability will become more clear as we further this exercise. So the exchange has been made and now $10 billion sits in a commercial bank account. Here is where it gets really interesting. For as based on the fractional reserve practice, that $10 billion deposit instantly becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And regarding reserve requirements, as stated in Modern Money Mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a $10 billion deposit, 10% or 1 billion is held as the required reserve while the other $9 billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now, it is logical to assume that this $9 billion is literally coming out of the existing $10 billion deposit. However, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the $9 billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing $10 billion deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in Modern Money Mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the nine billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a $10 billion deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available $9 billion. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated, and in turn 90% of the 9 billion, or 8.1 billion, is now available as newly created money for more loans. 
And of course, that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited, creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion, etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency. They don't say debase the currency, they don't say devalue the currency, they don't say cheat the people who are saved, they say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply, without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy, will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the US dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought, for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates. For in our financial system, money is debt and debt is money. Here is a chart of the US money supply from 1950 to 2006. Here is a chart of the US national debt for the same period. How interesting it is that the trends are virtually the same. For the more money there is, the more debt there is. The more debt there is, the more money there is. To put it a different way, every single dollar in your wallet is owed to somebody by somebody. For remember, the only way the money can come into existence is from loans. Therefore, if everyone in the country were able to pay off all debts, including the government, there would not be one dollar in circulation. In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived, and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913, the Federal Reserve. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. Now, so far we have discussed the reality that money is created out of debt, through loans. 
These loans are based on a bank's reserves, and reserves are derived from deposits. And through this fractional reserve system, any one deposit can create nine times its original value, in turn debasing the existing money supply, raising prices in society. And since all this money is created out of debt, and circulated randomly through commerce, people become detached from their original debt, and a disequilibrium exists, where people are forced to compete for labor, in order to pull enough money out of the money supply to cover their costs of living. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation. And it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself. The application of interest. When the government borrows money from the Fed, or when a person borrows money from a bank, it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest. In other words, almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well. But, if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. The ramifications of this are staggering, for the amount of money owed back to the banks will always exceed the amount of money that is available in circulation. This is why inflation is a constant in the economy, for new money is always needed to help cover the perpetual deficit built into the system, caused by the need to pay the interest. What this also means is that mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and there will always be poor pockets of society that get the short end of the stick. An analogy would be a game of musical chairs, for once the music stops, somebody is left out to dry. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly, who was challenging the foreclosure of his home by the bank, which provided the loan to purchase it. His argument was that the mortgage contract required both parties, being he and the bank, each put up a legitimate form of property for the exchange. In legal language, this is called consideration. Mr. Daly explained that the money was, in fact, not the property of the bank, for it was created out of nothing as soon as the loan agreement was signed. Remember what modern money mechanics stated about loans? What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits. Reserves are unchanged by the loan transactions, but deposit credits constitute new additions to the total deposits of the banking system. In other words, the money doesn't come out of their existing assets. The bank is simply inventing it, putting up nothing of its own except for a theoretical liability on paper. As the court case progressed, the bank's president, Mr. Morgan, took the stand, and in the judge's personal memorandum, he recalled that the plaintiff, bank's president, admitted that, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank, did create the money and credit upon its books by bookkeeping entry. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law or statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. The jury found that there was no lawful consideration and I agree. He also poetically added, only God can create something of value out of nothing. And upon this revelation, the court rejected the bank's claim for foreclosure and daily kept his home. The implications of this court decision are immense. For every time you borrow money from a bank, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card charge, the money given to you is not only counterfeit, it is an illegitimate form of consideration and hence voids the contract to repay. 
for the bank never had the money as property to begin with. Unfortunately, such legal realizations are suppressed and ignored, and the game of perpetual wealth transfer and perpetual debt continues. And this brings us to the ultimate question. Why? According to Ukraine's interior ministry, an estimated 400,000 women under the age of 30 were lured from just the Ukraine in the past decade. And that's just one of the former Soviet states. Spectre quotes the International Organization for Migration as estimating that 500,000 Eastern Bloc women are trafficked into Western Europe and around the world annually. It's a human tragedy of huge proportions and one that receives very little press. It is the greatest and most egregious violation of human rights and it's the great shame of our age that more is not done to stop this horrific crime. The New York Times titled the article, Slave Traders Lure Slavic Women. Imagine if it accurately was headlined, Jewish Slave Traders Lure European Women. If an article was titled, Mafia Slave Traders Lure Women, Mafia being a clearly Italian derived word, no one would have blinked twice or objected. But the media doesn't dare tell the truth. One doesn't have to go to the very depths of organized crime to see the huge criminal thefts of the 20th century. In America, the biggest thieves in history were, until Madoff, Michael Milken, Irvin Boesky, and the Wall Street swindlers of hundreds of millions of dollars. They received punishments equal to a thief stealing a pack of gum. Another was Mark Rich and his theft of hundreds of millions of dollars. And the Jewish inside political influence that got him a pardon even while skipping bail and being a fugitive. Now that's a first. Charged with the theft of millions, you're a fugitive and you're pardoned while you're still on the run. It doesn't the take a genius to see where the trends are going. The trends that the media won't talk about. And given the pattern of political, economic and environmental negligence and abuse, we're on a collision course. Are there solutions to these problems? Yes, there are. But they are so far outside of the status quo and a threat to those in power both politically and economically that they are just outright dismissed as irrational and absurd. The self-appointed guardians of the status quo won't even hear it because it's far outside of their reference and identity. This is where the Zeitgeist Movement comes in. I'm really sorry to say, we can no longer rely on government institutions to steer us in the right direction. Every government on this planet is locked into an economically oriented social program which is self-serving, unsustainable, and destructive to one degree or another. The possibility of a smooth transition into a new enlightened social design which does not have the negative byproducts is extremely limited given the options made available in the current order, meaning the legal system, the political system, etc. Likewise, we can no longer endure the profit-driven ethos of the corporate and financial powers which control all of our precious resources on the planet. Resources we all need for survival. Society today is sick and the illness permeates all life systems within it. And I see the Zeitgeist movement as the immune system. I have said from the very beginning that Libya is a strategic distraction for the United States. We should never have done more than merely help the people in Benghazi, protect themselves. It's a civil war as I predicted it would become. And my concern is that NATO has not accomplished the job that it was supposed to accomplish in a matter of weeks. Ambassador Chris Stevens, Sean Smith, Tyrone Woods, England Dory, Libyan investigators, and the FBI are trying to find those responsible. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten. We will bring to justice those who took them from us. And in the midst of their grief, the most forceful attempt yet from a U.S. official to try to stop the rioting across the Middle East. Rioting sparked by the amateur video clip denigrating the Prophet Muhammad, but fueled by long-running resentment of U.S. policies in the region, such as the Mideast peace process, drone strikes, and U.S. support for Israel. 
the people of Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Tunisia did not trade the tyranny of a dictator for the tyranny of a mob. We have moved past the tipping point for global war in the Middle East. Aircraft carriers crowd the Persian Gulf. The U.S. Navy having recently deployed a fourth aircraft carrier to the region, along with a fleet of underwater drones preparing for an inevitable attack on Iran. The United States having already sent three massive aircraft carriers to the waterways outside of Iran, including the USS Enterprise, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the USS Abraham Lincoln, will now add the USS John C. Stennis to the fleet. These ships are equipped with billions of dollars worth of weaponry and service personnel, and America's newest addition to the battlefront is invisible to those on land and can be controlled from anywhere in the world. Recent military maneuverings as well as the deployment of a flotilla of 11 Russian warships coincides perfectly with an upcoming UN meeting scheduled this Friday on July 20th. The United Nations will be discussing the armed conflict in Syria that has conveniently come on the heels of an intense media fury over the alleged Trimsa killings that according to U.S. media outlets has been a civilian massacre accounting for hundreds of civilian deaths. However, after a comprehensive UN investigation of the attack on the Syrian city on Saturday, it has been concluded that the attack on Trimsa actually targeted heavily armed rebels and terrorist groups, not innocent civilians. The findings directly contradict opposition claims of civilian killings by Assad forces. The West is playing a media blame game in order to aggravate popular support for a new war, and what is abundantly clear is that the United States is looking for a repeat of the Libyan invasion that left Muammar Gaddafi brutally murdered. The mainstream media cry for humanitarian aid is really just a mask for a violent U.S.-led regime change in Syria. President Barack Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton want Bashar al-Assad dead, and if they have their way, a bloody and violent new global war is about to erupt. parking space. John Bolton basically said in an interview today that he doesn't think President Barack Obama will order an attack on Iran and basically Israel should go ahead and attack Iran's nuclear program on its own. Okay, fine. Well and good. The problem here is that what Josh Bolton is thinking is that Israel will attack Iran, Iran will retaliate, and then Bolton is going to be up there, he's going to be one of the first people up there screaming, yes, we must send American troops to protect Israel from Iran's unreasonable response to having their power infrastructure destroyed. We must protect those precious Israeli children from harm. We've got all these bullet stoppers here, just put them on over there, that's what they're here for. So, Romney's campaign chairman... Tim Pawlenty is out there screaming, time to start the clock ticking on Iran. We must be willing to use military force to stop Iran. What you mean we, pale face? I have a message for Tim and Mitt. If you really feel that way, that war with Iran is a good idea, here's your rifle, here's your parachute. We ran out of the desert camo, but here's a bright day-glow orange jumpsuit left over from Abu Ghraib for you to wear. Watch your head stepping into that airplane, and we'll call Tehran and tell them you're on your way to kick their butts all by yourself. But after that whopper, you government boys told us all about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. You will forgive the rest of us Americans if we sit this one out. I know what's going on here, and so do you. Every time the United States banking system gets itself into a jam... The U.S. government gets into a world war as a distraction. Yes, you're all poor and starving, but there's a war on. You must support the country and the bankers no matter what. 
Crash of 1907, distract from it with World War I. Crash of 1929, get into World War II. Crash of 2008, the U.S. government's already invaded ten countries on two continents. Technically, it's already a world war. That's what they do. And just remember, and share this with all of your friends, before the creation of the Federal Reserve, there was no such thing as a world war. Hadn't happened. World War is a creation of the bankers. It makes them a lot of money. Because everybody has to borrow money from the bankers to fight the war, and then they have to borrow more money to rebuild from the war. And after it's all over, you've got more or less the same life you had before, except the graveyards are a lot bigger. And you're back on the hook to the bankers for another 50 to 100 years. That's the game. Normally, people want to stop borrowing, but in a war, they must borrow to save the nation, to serve God, to kill the heathen, whatever the excuse is. It's a way of stimulating more borrowing, which is what the entire private central bank concept is on. Without more borrowing, they will fail. The American people have stopped borrowing. The government has borrowed all that it can on behalf of the American people, without your permission, I might add. So the only other way to keep this pyramid system, this Ponzi scheme, going a little further is to get a good world war going that will force the government and the people to borrow more money. We can't let them choose whether or not they're going to borrow more money. The whole system will come apart. Anyway, a little program note I forgot to mention at the top of uh, the hour. The phone lines are open today, 800-313-9443, 800-313-9443. And the lovely Miss Crystal, as always, is sitting in our control room taking care of uh, all the electronics there and ready to answer your calls when you call on in. Now, in response to comments coming out of the Non-Aligned Movement Summit, which is taking place in Tehran right now, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is saying he's going to go up to the U.N. General Assembly this next month, and he's going to set the record straight. Well, we already know that pretty much everybody in the United Nations is going to go along with Israel because they're all bought and paid for the way the U.S. is. Every time Ahmadinejad addressed the General Assembly, half the audience would walk out and go down and get their donations from their various Israeli politicians and whatnot. If Netanyahu really had gonadal tissue, he'd go over to Tehran and he'd speak to those people and try and convince them that what they're saying is nonsense. Not going to happen. Netanyahu only plays to captive audiences. Emphasis on captive. Remember when he uh, addressed the United States Congress and every third word out of his mouth, the entire Congress stood up like a bunch of trained seals to applaud. Netanyahu says, we must kill Iran. We must... Take the Palestinians' land. (coughs) Rachel Corey had it coming. (coughs) We found out later on, AIPAC had gone to every member of Congress and said, look, we're going to have cameras watching you. And anybody who doesn't stand up and cheer Netanyahu doesn't get any more money for the next campaign. That's how that was accomplished here. So Netanyahu is out there screaming. He's incensed that Iran is calling for a nuclear-free Middle East because Netanyahu knows Iran doesn't actually have nuclear weapons. And so this message by Iran is basically intended for Israel's nuclear weapons, which Netanyahu is still trying to act like everybody, you know, believes him when he says we don't really have nuclear weapons or we're not going to say one with the other. The secret's out. Israel is a nuclear armed nation. They're the world's sixth most powerful nuclear power out there. We know they've been building nuclear bombs underneath Dimona. We know they got their first round of fissionables from the United States of America for their first generation nuclear weapons. The whole Numex scandal going on back there. Uh, Mysterious material unaccounted for at the uh, Oak Ridge plant. And on and on and on again. By the way, apparently another Israeli spy ring was caught in this country. Department of Justice shut down that investigation. This nation is owned by Israel. Let me back up and say that. This nation's government is owned by Israel. We have an occupation government. We have Washington, D.C. is just another Vichy government, and they managed to do it without most people noticing, although now you're aware that it's going on with this situation. So Israel's out there saying, you, Americans, send your children to kill our enemies. And the government goes, oh, 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 oh. Now, the vice premier of Israel is saying that all of this dissension against war in Iran inside the United States is hurting them. It's undermining the credibility of a military threat against Iran. And I don't think what he realizes is he's basically advertising to the world that Israel's plan for war on Iran involves dead Americans. 
Israel is not going to go to war against Iran all by itself. Because those Israeli children are so precious. We can't risk them. We have to use the Americans. That's what they're for. That's the only reason God put Americans on the planet, is to make war on Israel's enemies out there. Meanwhile, over at uh, the Atlantic Magazine, uh, they have a new thing called the Iran War Dial. And they announced earlier today that the Iran War Dial, the Atlantic's Iran War Dial, is now reading at 40%. It's a 40% chance of war with Iran. Well, the Atlantic's Iran War Dial may be at 40%, but over here at whatreallyhappened.com, the bovine excrement meter just pegged. It's just another way of trying to convince you that everybody wants to go along with this thing, and it is a lie. There is nobody not on a federal government paycheck or some form of assistance who thinks a new war is a good idea at this time. And we all know that everything they said about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction was complete fiction. We've had an ex-member of the IAEA came out earlier this week and said all of the accusations against Iran about weapons of mass destruction, it's just rumor and innuendo coming out of Israel. There is no factual evidence at all to support the idea that Iran is building a nuclear weapon, although personally I wouldn't blame them if they were, to use as a deterrent. Because that's what nuclear weapons are for, to deter attack and invasion. And the U.S.'s attitude is, you're not allowed to refuse an invasion by the United States of America. That, that's just not done here. Now, yesterday we reported how NATO was caught smuggling weapons into Syria to arm what we are laughingly referring to as the Free Syria Army. It's a bunch of hired mercenaries from outside the country. And they've been caught with American weapons and Israeli weapons. Now NATO sending in weapons. And apparently NATO, without publicly announcing it, has be- authorized a Syrian invasion. Yeah, this whole thing about a popular uprising didn't work out. Those gosh darn mercenaries who paid them so much money and they failed to get rid of Assad. So what the heck, we're just going to go on and invade Syria. Because if we don't invade Syria, it's going to be harder to invade Iran. You just see the war plan right in front of you. And they're just hoping that you're just going to go along believing this bovine excrement from the corporate media that this is all necessary and just, and God will bless us if we destroy yet another innocent country. We'll be right back. It's not our problem. It's not up to us to rush over to Israel to protect Israel. If we're doing this for religious reasons, it's it's God's issue, not ours. Um, If we don't believe in God, what's our reason for protecting Israel? Do we believe in war? Even so, it's, it's not our place to go over there. Whether or not you believe in God or whether or not you don't believe in God, if you believe in America, it's not our place to go there. Either way you look at it, our place is to be here. I don't know anyone that doesn't want to love their neighbor as themselves, you know, treat others with respect, uh, see that the poor people are no longer poor, that uh, our country has prosperity, that when we work for a living, we get a good wage. I mean, the resources in America belong to the Americans. Gold belongs to us. The oil belongs to us, not big corporations, especially big corporations overseas. Why the heck does the oil in America belong to people overseas? And I don't know anyone that thinks that the government should be making decisions for us. I mean, did you vote to to go to Libya and fight in Libya? and destroy that country? Did you vote to go to war without This is Dennis Mason with an LPAC update. The focus of the drive for world war in the new Balkans has shifted momentarily from Syria to Iran. There is no possibility of a general warfare today without it escalating into a thermonuclear war, which would be the end of civilization. As we reported yesterday, Israel's Netanyahu and Barak are determined to strike at Iran. Now, Israel's only capability for achieving that objective is to launch nuclear warheads. And last week, Israel tested their Jericho 3 ballistic missile, the delivery system which would do that job. On Thursday, Israeli Defense Minister Ehud Barak arrived in London to consult with top British national security officials, meeting with Foreign Secretary William Hague, new Defense Minister Philip Hammond, and Cameron's National Security Advisor Sir Peter Ricketts. Now, during Barack's visit, the Prime Minister's office issued a statement saying that Iran is no more than 12 months away from having all of the component elements of a nuclear bomb in hand. 
Now add to this Obama's remarks from the G20 summit, where he waved the IAEA report on Iran around as a reason to target them. Now that report hasn't even come out yet. Now add to this the passage of a bill out of the House Foreign Relations Committee titled the Iran Threat Reduction Act. This act, were it enacted into law from Congress, would make it illegal for any U.S. diplomat or military official to have any contact with an Iranian official or agent unless the president certifies to Congress at least 15 days in advance that a failure to make such a contact would pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the vital national security interests of the United States. 15 days. The Cuban Missiles Crisis was 13 days long. What would have been the outcome if Kennedy had had to wait 15 days for permission from Congress to talk to the Soviets? Now, there is growing public recognition internationally of this danger of a new world war. Another former head of the Mossad, Efrahim Halevi, on the 16th anniversary of the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, added his voice to the resistance to this war from within Israel, denying that Iran is an existential threat. And the Secretary General of NATO, the organization under which Obama waged a legal war in Libya, rejected any support for military action against Iran in a statement issued yesterday. He had made a similar statement regarding Syria earlier in the week. Hua Laming, a former Chinese ambassador to Iran, wrote in the China Daily, The U.S. expects to not only prevent Iran from becoming a regional power, but also to overthrow its Islamic regime if possible. One of the U.S.'s tactics is to mobilize the international community to pressure Iran by making use of its nuclear issue. One of the U.S.'s important goals is to extend the anti-government wave to Iran and Syria. Now, on the U.S. allegation that Iran was behind the plot reported in October to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington, Hua said, We don't know which side is lying. But it is apparent that the U.S. is sensationalizing the allegation with a motive. Washington's political intention behind the move is clear, too, considering the complicated situation in the Middle East. Washington's allegation against Tehran for plotting the Saudi ambassador's assassination is a prelude to tougher U.S. actions against Iran. And the German branch of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War has issued an urgent call to the German government to talk to the governments of the United States, Britain, and Israel, talk them out of any plans for an attack on Iran, and to refrain from any threats of war. These public statements are good, even necessary. But to stop this impending nuclear war, remove Obama from power. The British are intent on using their creature in the American presidency to the fullest extent to destroy any remaining stability in the world as their monetarist system crumbles into dust. Obama is a monster who has killed American citizens without due process, launched an illegal war with no congressional authorization, and assassinated a foreign head of state and bragged about it. His behavior at the G20 summit only confirms his eligibility as candidate for the 25th Amendment. If we fail to remove him from power, this new war, a thermonuclear nightmare from which humanity may not ever recover, is assured. We had the opportunity also to talk about uh, a range of security issues. Um, one in particular that I want to mention uh, is the continuing threat posed by Iran's nuclear program. The IAEA is scheduled to release a report on Iran's nuclear program next week, and President Sarkozy and I agree on the need to maintain the unprecedented international pressure on Iran to meet its obli uh, obligations. Uh, and finally, I'm looking forward to joining Nikola and service members from both of our countries tomorrow to celebrate the alliance between our two countries, which spans more than 200 years, from Yorktown to Libya. Who really presents the biggest nuclear threat to the world? Iran? Members of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, who cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency? Or Israel, who refuse to sign the treaty and refuse to even admit they have nukes? 
Let's consider the nuclear weaponry Israel is believed to have. Up to 400 atomic and hydrogen nukes, including thermonuclear weapons in the megaton range. A range of systems, including neutron bombs, tactical nukes, and suitcase nukes. Delivery mechanisms, including Jericho intercontinental ballistic missiles with a range of 11,500 kilometers and offshore second strike capabilities using submarine launched nuclear capable cruise missiles. Whilst Iran has consistently denied developing nukes, Israel has repeatedly threatened the world with theirs. Israel operates a strategy known as the Samson option, a policy in which any threat to Israel will be responded to with massive nuclear retaliation. Samson is the biblical figure who destroyed a Philistine temple killing himself and thousands of Philistine enemies. An Israeli official is quoted in Seymour Hersh's book as declaring, we can still remember the smell of Auschwitz and Treblinka. Next time, we'll take all of you with us. General Mosh Dayan, a leading promoter of Israel's nuclear program, stated, Israel must be like a mad dog, too dangerous to bother. Martin van Kreufeld, a professor of military history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, said, Most European capitals are targets for our air force. We have the capability to take the world down with us, and I can assure you that that will happen before Israel goes under. Israeli whistleblower Mordechai Vanunu alleged that Israel blackmails the world with its ability to bombard any city all over the world, and not only those in Europe, but also those in the United States. Israel's threats to preemptively attack other countries have increased since Iran began enriching uranium for its nuclear energy program. Whilst it's unlikely Israel seriously believes Iran would attack them, Iran knows it would likely be obliterated if it dared to attack Israel with any form of weaponry. Israel cannot tolerate the possibility of a nuclear-armed Iran. Any challenge to Israel's nuclear hegemony could weaken its ability to use the nuclear threat in order to hold on to stolen Palestinian land. The nuclear-armed Iran might see Israeli citizens leave the country and its occupied territories. Investment could decline, reducing the finances needed to fund and maintain Israel's illegitimate expansion. Israel's large stockpile of nuclear weapons and the fact that many high-profile Israelis have declared that the country is quite prepared to use them if threatened should be of great concern to everyone. Israel, and their neocon and Zionist allies in the US government, pose a much graver threat to world peace than Iran. Soviet sanitary, get me out of here quick before the shadow man gets back to Gad, he's in the heart of Transylvania. Isn't that a radiation zone? Yeah, this place is hot. Touch those radioactive punches, and you'll never need a nightlight. Sanitarium is a polite term for prison, where Mad Dr. Ukrainian keeps people he needs. Commando, liberate Nick and the patients in that hospital, especially Comrade Ivan.